Hello and welcome to this episode of After the Breach Podcast. We're your hosts, Jeff Friedman and Sarah Shimazu, coming to you from Friday Harbor on San Juan Island. We've gotten some great fees- feedback from our listeners and one of the most requested topics, Jeff, was how we got into doing what we do. What drew us to the whales? What keeps us coming back for more? So I think uh, today we're just going to talk about that and more. Uh, we have a few fun things to talk about and, of course, all of the recent sightings we've had from the Sailor Sea. So thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy it and uh, we can't wait to bring you even more whale-filled episodes from here on out. Jeff, how's it going? Hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just got off the water. So thanks for delaying this a little bit. Into Absolutely. The afternoon. Who'd you see today? Oh, we saw the T-137s. Excellent. Yeah. They were cruising east at a pretty good clip, like six and a half knots coming east. Very nice. I had been wondering when they were going to come back. Well, they're here. And uh, apparently the T-36Bs and T-69s showed up near Race Rocks today while we were out there as well. That T-69s, that's a, a family we've seen Quite a bit of this year compared to uh, any year that I remember. Yeah, yeah, the big, the big guy, T sixty nine C. I think uh, he's he's huge, huge dorsal fin, tiny eye patch. We've talked about this big, on a previous episode. Right, the big guy with the little eye patch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've uh, gotten some great feedback, and we got some nice um, words and emails from from some listeners. The feedback's been great, and it, it's I've been really amazed sometimes on on the boat when people just say hey you know I've, i listen to your podcast it's it's reaching it's reaching people that uh I, I would never have guessed yeah i think what's surprising me is like people are hearing the podcast and then coming out i i kind of expected like people to come out with us and then listen to the podcast but not necessarily the other way around so it's it's really cool to um have met a lot of people that have Found us because of it. So if you guys are coming out and joining us on lo- on on the water online, I said, but on the water, um, make sure to let us know. We'd love to to know that you're a listener and and meet you in person. And if you're not coming out, come out. Yeah, it's still been beautiful out here. It was gla- glass calm today. Uh, fall is living up to its name. It's one of our favorite times of the year to be out on the water here. Absolutely. We've had some incredible, incredible sightings lately. Uh, one, you know, one of the, we've been running some all day tours, uh, which we, we do in, in September and October and sometimes a few in August. And, uh, they've been, they've, they're all different. Uh, it's different every time out there, but one that stands out to me is the all day we did a few weeks ago when we had a huge aggregation of humpbacks. It was so cool. And this is something that happens from time to time in the out west of Victoria in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, probably about 20 plus miles west of Victoria. And it's something that we see at different times between August and October, and it comes and goes. So it's not like a consistent thing we can plan on, and the weather has to work out. Uh, we need, need calm weather, and we need an all-day tour to get there because it's a long way. Uh, I think the, la- the last one we went on was about 50 miles yeah. uh, from, from Friday Harbor, but well worth the the long distance travel because we counted at least 100 humpbacks. Yeah. A small, really small area. Really small area. And just looking out like out West, South towards the Olympic peninsula, you just saw blows and backs and flukes everywhere. I would say easily 150 to 200 within, you know, what, 10, 10 miles or so. And the, the audio of just being able yeah. to sit there quietly and listen to blows in every direction, just constant. And it's, it's such a, the, the only frustrating part about it is, is that we have to leave. Well, that <laughs> Of course, because I could sit there forever and watch that. But the uh, the other thing is, it's really impossible to capture in a photo or a video what's really going on because you're seeing blows in the distance as far as you can see, and all, and some really close, and you're seeing flukes everywhere. But you just you can't capture something like that in a photo or a video. Yeah, the enormity of it is just hard to hard to express without being there and. Uh, there were some pretty interesting things that we saw while we were out there with those humpbacks. I think um, that that it was that day. Remember, we had that humpback whale that came up to us, or not up to us, but like up to, towards the boat and was 
you know, probably a hundred yards or so away from us, kind of at the surface and then lifted its head up out of the water um, repeatedly while it's, you know, it was lo- like logging at the surface and would just kind of like lift its head up almost like it was doing like an aerial scan or like looking at us um, repeatedly. Possibly a, a, an after the breach listener, maybe. Maybe. He was like, hey, I think that's Jeff and Sarah. <laughs> We also saw Caspian. We did. We did. A very cool looking humpback. We'll have to put, we do have some photos. Um, we'll post those in the show notes that probably the coolest looking humpback yeah, I've, it's got I've a, ever seen. Some of that modeled, like, I don't know. It's just almost looks kind of like a gray whale. It um, looks like a hybrid, like a gray yeah, humpback hybrid. But really, really cool markings um, for that whale. It's so cool to, to spot that, that whale out there. And we did have an event out there. We weren't there for this, uh, but hearing hearing it from other boats on the radio while we were with other whales on the water, but there was, uh, I don't know, an altercation. Altercation, altercation. <laughs> yeah. And th- this made news. Uh, I mean, this hit. Went national. Now, yeah. I mean, this, this. I saw the story on CNN, and we had two humpbacks uh, in an altercation with, I think, about 15 Biggs killer whales. Yeah, and I think some of them from some were California tees, I think. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Was it 253s, I think? Yeah, 252, 253, something, something. I'll have to look. And it went on all day. Well, yeah, I, I, I was off the water. I was just getting down to the boat um, to fuel. I had a late trip and was hearing, like, the f- final bits of it and... Um, I really got down to the boat in time to hear over the radio, like the humpback whales just dove. We just saw all th- like they had three at that point. Another one had come in. Uh, they were getting crazy vocals on the hydrophone from the killer whales. And they said the humpback whales just dove and the fog came in and we can see nothing. And everything went silent. It was kind of very eerie. Yeah, and then then nothing, every, then nothing. And I think everybody left. I think the the waves were getting pretty big at that point yeah, too. Yeah. Um, and it had been foggy out there on and off throughout the day. I was about 15 miles away and we were with some humpbacks and I was, I was really tempted to extend the tour and go sure. out there. Uh, but I, the fog deterred me a little bit. I knew like we would be really tight on time if we went out there. The other thing was it wasn't really clear yet what was going on. And I, I just made the assumption that, the bigs were going after a, it was a mom and calf pair and that they were going after the calf. And that's not something I, I want to see. I mean, yeah, I know it happens. Tough. I yeah. get it, but I don't, I don't want to see it, especially with a mom calf pair that we know. Like I, I don't, I don't just, sure. I don't get wanna, attached. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't need to witness that. But I think it ended up being two adults. Is it, was, what I heard. it was two adults. We yeah. don't know how it started. Don't know how it started. Um, but uh, from all all in apparent, you know, from what's apparent, the humpback whales lived. Um, there was no kill or anything like that. I, well, I know one of them has, has have they both been seen? Because I knew one of them had been seen. Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly, Since it wasn't, Hy- was Hydra one of them? Hy- 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 it was Hydra and Reaper. And I know that Hydra has been seen. Okay. I don't know if Reaper has been seen, but from what I read of the account, um, they were really focused. The the killer whales were really focused on Reaper. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but it also sounds like it was a it was a somewhat of a back and forth that it, it, it yeah. wasn't a one way altercation. That there was some mutual harassment going on, which makes me wonder if the humpbacks instigated it, um, and the killer whales were on a hunt of like a sea lion or something like that. And I heard you talking about that the other day as a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so many, and I wasn't there, so I, I don't know. But um, we've seen it before where killer whales have been on a hunt for an unrelated species to humpback whales. And we've had humpback whales, I mean, from a ways away, like over a mile at times, change their direction of travel and come right in and interrupt a hunt. Like we had, I think, Jeff, it was you and I up by Susha Island years ago. Um, we had the T seventy five Bs and Cs, and they were on a hunt uh, for a harbor seal, and they had actually killed it. Uh, and we had Heather and Raptor come in, and they like came from a mile away and came right in and were trumpeting and very agitated. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting behavior, and that's reco- has been recorded in other parts of the world too. And it's just it's it really 
and we talked about this on our last episode when we talked about uh, the humpbacks of the silver bank. It's it, so many times we're like, what is going on in their mind? What right. are they thinking when they come in? Uh, on, I mean, this doesn't impact them directly at all. And they come in with what is going through their mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many potential, potential reasons and theories. Um, and we did talk about this a little bit more with Tasley on that episode with Tasley about the humpbacks of the Salish Sea. And I think it's something we will probably see more of as our humpback population continues to grow. It's been another uh, another really good year with moms and calves. We did see... Just uh, found a new one. Well, we I did we find two? Because we did find one that was uh, on the day of the humpback aggregation on the all-day tour. and I th- Oh, yeah, it's Souk. Yeah, and that mm-hmm. that was a newly re- documented calf. Yeah. Um, and then and not a new calf because obviously they're born yeah, in I the don't green know. waters, but it was the first documentation, I think. I, of that yeah, calf. I'm not sure on that. I, I know that Tasley had been out there and some other folks had been out there um, taking some ID photos of humpbacks out that way. So she might have seen to souk with, with a calf before we did, but... But Sarah um, documented a, a new calf we that did. has not been documented yet this summer. Well, I, um, I'd like to say we did. You know, we found found a mom and calf. You actually spotted them first, Jeff. Uh, yesterday was it yesterday? No, the day before yesterday. It was the day before yesterday. We had well, we had a shore report, so that helped. I yeah, knew, I knew. Yeah. Puts ru- us in the I area. Roughly, yeah, it put us in the area, and yeah, and and we found them, and it turned out to be a, a calf that no one has documented yet this year. Yeah. Potentially, I mean, again, someone might have seen it, but uh, we didn't know that Vivaldi um, is the humpback whale. I love, I love that whale, Vivaldi. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a uh, second known calf. I think this would be for her. Do you know d- the name of, the, of her first calf? I don't. This one, I think we're pushing for October. <laughs> okay, well, we'll 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 take that up off off the air. We'll debate that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's been really cool. And that calf was super active in that fairy wake, Jeff. That was probably one of my highlights for humpbacks this season, even going west, was seeing that humpback calf uh, breach repeatedly in that fairy wake. Yeah, the one of the BC fairies came through and, and threw a huge wake and the calf just went nuts and, and breaching and, and chin slapping over and over. Uh, definitely. I mean, that's a high, a trip highlight. Right yeah. There. And I think what was cool for me is too, like whenever it did, did one of those behaviors, um, water came out of its mouth. I don't know if you noticed that, but like it, it would have like a spray of water coming out of its mouth. Definitely having fun. Yeah. Well, as kids are supposed to, it is, it is a great time of year, uh, for humpbacks, uh, all around the Salish Sea, they seem to be pretty active. They're moving around quite a bit. There, we're getting a lot that were further north during the the peak of the summer are now moving down here, and and it just seems like everything is so alive in the Salish Sea at this time of year. All right, guys. Well, truth be told, Jeff and I recorded an episode. Um, we talked about what we're going to talk about in a little bit um, earlier, but then something amazing happened. And we have an impromptu guest, our friend and colleague, April Ryan, um, to talk about an amazing encounter that they had. Amazing and heart-wrenching. Um, so, guys, you witnessed something incredible the following day after Jeff and I recorded and honestly talked about this very thing. Uh, you witnessed the T-65As and the T-99s taking down a minky whale. Yeah, and, and so we had talked about this in the recorded episode that we were getting ready to air and to, to drop. And what happened was we had talked about one of our uh, most memorable sightings in previous years. And one of those was a minky chase, where but the minky got away. And we talked about like the idea of, of seeing an actual minky predation and we had to re-record this, this episode because we actually saw that exact thing play out the very next day after we recorded. Um, April and I were, were out on a tour and we found the 65 A's and the 99's two two families uh traveling together. Well, and we've talked about them before. We on have our talked episode. about yeah. And and they were not hunting when you first saw they them, were is that not. right? They were not. No, they, we, we first, and we would have seen it because if, 
and I and I've thought more about this. If there had been a chase going on, we would have not only seen the splashes, but we found them about three miles from where a um, recreational boater had first reported them an hour and a half earlier. And had they been chasing the minky, they would have been a lot further than that because the we've seen them chasing minkies before and it's 10 miles plus. Right. And, and you found, you found this happening on, on a bank, which is kind of where these minky whales congregate to feed. So uh, in all likelihood, they probably snuck up on this whale and you guys were there right from the very beginning. Yeah, that's totally what it looked like. Um, When we started seeing whales, we had seen a big male in the distance and As we're trying to get IDs, I just said to Jeff, I've got the 65 A's, but I've only got mom Artemis and the little girl Callisto. So 65 A and 65 A6. And I couldn't confirm anybody else. But then our guest just started pointing and there's this, oh, over there. And they were super spread out, but, but, but not doing anything. They were, it was, it was what we would normally tell people they were in search mode. Mm -hmm. They're very spread out, uh, but we didn't notice anything unusual. Sure, spread out in ones and twos, sometimes over miles. Right, they're searching for food. And long down times and yeah. Right, yeah, just to clarify, when we say search mode, they're searching for, for, for lunch. And they found it. Yes, they did. So what kind of clued you in on on this, like, right from the go? Because from what you told me, it was like an immediate, like, light flip, a light, light, fl- light switch flipped, um, and, and the hunt was on. Yes. So first, I think it was 65A who porpoised, and then we saw more porpoising in the distance. Everywhere. Like, it was, all directions porpoising. It was, it was, like, everywhere. Coming in, going away. At first, my first impression was every every single whale, all nine of them, they were each chasing their own porpoise. Oh, that's 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 what yeah. I would have guessed at the that's that was my first thought. And then I saw this minky whale porpoise out of the water, and it's and I just screamed, "It's a minky!" I I can verify that she screamed, "It's a minky!" Yeah, and from there it was just this very rapid process of all of these whales converging on this poor creature. And it was, it, they were like a net that would, had this poor guy circled or girl. And it was over relatively quickly. My, and I haven't asked you this before, but my, when, when this first went down and, and, and we both saw that minky breach at the very beginning and the whales were still spread, my first feel of, of what was happening was there, there was going to be a chase, but yes. my, I fully expected it, it to be just that they were going to chase it for a little while. And the minky was going to get away. That's what I was prepared for. I was not expecting. We've, we've never heard of these families taking big whales and, you know, 27 feet, 20,000 pounds. That's, that's a good size prey. Right, right. I don't know that these two have ever been documented <clears throat> like during during a hunt on a whale. I know that we had one instance several years ago where they were feeding on what looked like the remains of a whale um, out near Victoria. But and we interesting did, that it's the same two families. Same too. two yes. families. And the only other time that I've seen, and I did see, we, we were all three of us were there to see them feeding, but nobody saw the takedown. But... Uh, a couple of years ago when there were a few families chasing a minky and it was, they, the minky got away. Right. It was 65 A's younger sister, 65 B who was one of the two instigators of that. Yeah. And so with as quickly as it went down, it's to me obvious that they've done this before. Yeah. Very practiced. They, yes. They, the, the kids, the three 65 A kids came up surrounding that minky whale as it was surfacing. And the two moms, 65A and 99, would come up here and there and delivering body blows. But you were saying that from the roof, you could see two of them underwater. 
Yeah. So I think the the most so uh, all right, a couple things because we're still processing this. This right, was just right. uh, four four three days ago. Three days ago, and um, I started shooting photos, and we're, April got great photos, and we'll post those in the show notes. And April said to me very early on as we were, she basically said, hey, you should be up on the roof taking video. Uh, so I, I, I said, yes, dear. Good foresight, April. <laughs> yeah. And I jumped up on the roof and I, and I shot some video and we'll post, uh, I'm going to put some clips together and put it on our YouTube channel and, and we'll put a link in the show notes. But a few of the things that stand out the most to me from watching this was, I'll, I'll say three things. First, every single whale, uh, every si- single orca was a full participant in this hunt, all the way down to one year old ninety nine e. Um, every single whale was was in on this. Uh, one, the one thing I will probably never forget is how quickly it went from this is going to be a minky chase to this minky is isn't going to get away. It it was minutes and. Was there like a moment where you knew that it was not a chase anymore? Like this was going to be a successful kill. Like was there was there a moment that stands out in your mind that this this is this is not just a chase? Well, there there were two, and this is what I was going to say, and then then I want to hear what what April how what what went through her mind. The first was when I saw the minky surface, and at least six killer whales came up like at the same time on all sides of her. And I was like, well, and she wasn't porpoising. She just surfaced to get a breath and she was surrounded and they were all pointed in the same direction. It wasn't like what we normally think of. Oh, I have you surrounded. Right. It's not like they were all coming in on her. They were all, just, they were with, her. they were with her. They were next to her in front of her behind her. And I was like, she's got nowhere to go. But what really, really drove it home for me. So I'm up on the roof taking video and we were shut down and we're just watching this because they're, they weren't at this point, they weren't going very fast and they were just kind of going back and forth. They turned towards us and being on the roof, I can see down into the water and the minky came by very close to the bow and I wasn't able, this didn't come through on the video, but I could see it very clearly as the minky surfaced and went under the bow, like up in front of the bow. She had two killer whales clamped onto her. Uh, with their teeth one um it some it was either i don't think it was her pec fin it may have been her like ventral pleats and then the other was down by her peduncle and they weren't thrashing they weren't the killer whales weren't doing a thing other than just holding on to add weight sure that's like an extra twenty thousand plus pounds right and yeah. what amazed me about that was like you think if they're clamped on they're they're ripping they're trying to pull her down they were just gliding along with her, just adding that Tiring weight. her out. Yeah. 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 And that's when it's like, they're never going to let go. And she can't ride around with 20, like 20,000 pounds isn't going to take long yeah. for her to not be able to get a breath. And and we've mm-hmm. all seen hunts like stellar sea lion hunts, porpoise hunts, probably mostly with the stellar sea lions. We can feel when that energy changes, when it's like the fight versus mm-hmm. the inevitable. Yes. But April, what was that moment for you? When... It was pretty much like Jeff is saying. She was coming up, getting big breaths, and then it it seemed like she knew it was inevitable. And the kids were really directing her, and I think the two moms were the ones who were clamped on. And so as they're adding their weight to her, the kids are keeping her in a direction that, not truly directional, but they had her corralled, right? So that she couldn't really, she had no choice. And you could just see she had no ability to to keep staying up. And within, what, 20 minutes, they had her un, They had her submerged. That's and we didn't see her again. But it was 20 minutes. Like, we think about these whale hunts taking a long, long time. Um, you know, sometimes the stellar sea lion hunts take hours, and and this was just a matter of a handful of minutes, really. It's one. It's one of the shocking things, and I think April would agree too. Is this was shorter than any stellar hunt I've ever seen? Oh, absolutely. 
Stellar hunts minimum 45 minutes. Yeah. This was, this was fast. I mean, they had her and then, you know, it really, they went down on a dive. I mean, they had been going down and then they'd all come up together. They sometimes, you know, four or five minutes, there was a dive. I didn't, didn't time it, but it had to be at least eight to 10 minutes. And I think that we knew like, like that's it, that we're not, we're not going to see the minky again. And we never did in, at least in one piece. Oh, that's (laughs) true. Yeah. Yeah. And, Mm. and, um, this minky whale is one that is known. There's, you know, not not a lot of minky whales that are known um, here, and I think that it's between like eight and ten that were are believed to be like regular visitors to the right. Salish Sea, and this is one. Right, I've I've seen her many and times. I, I have as well, looking at yeah. the photos of the dorsal fin. But and if um, you two have seen her, then that means I that have Jeff's too. probably <laughs> seen her too. Um, but she was first documented here in 1982. I think is that yes, what? Yes, that's what, what Frankie said. Yeah. Yes. So an older whale, right? Because she looked right. like she was an adult in the photo from 1982. Um, so in her 40s, at least. At least. So possibly 50 or 60. So and we're, I think they estimate average lifespan, you know, between 40 and 50 years for minky whales. So an older animal for yes. sure. Mm. Which, yeah. I mean, does that make it? more okay. no i mean no not at all but i mean that's the thing is i think we're we're trying to grapple with how we how do we feel about about this and how right. do you how do you reconcile it and was it a quicker hunt because she was older and she didn't have like the the energy or you know was this just normal and like we don't see minky whale hunts and so but see, maybe then, it does take 20 to 30 minutes and that makes me go back to 2017 because it was the 65 a's and the 99s at constance and Nobody saw it happen. Nobody saw it happen, but they said, oh, we saw some skin and it looked like minky whale. Right, right. So So that leads more credence to the fact that it is fast. And when that, you know, this just popped into my head, when that whole thing went down, weren't we saying, how did no one see it happen? We were. I totally remember. Like, And maybe it's because it was fast. Yeah. Yes. And we were the only two. We saw this. Yeah, to- yeah, April and I were the only two. There were two other boats that were arriving on scene that I think they saw the last one or two surfacings of the minky. Mm-hmm. But by then it was, I mean, it was done. Um, yeah. Yeah, we were the only ones that there. saw the main hunt. Yeah. Yeah, because I think Ellie got one photo of the minky whale with the whales. And right. that was, and then she was like, that was like the last surfacing. She didn't see yeah. it again after that. Yeah. I mean, just it's, it's. It's still hard for me to believe that we even saw this. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, like Jeff said, I was expecting it to be a chase. That's right. what I thought was going to happen. I thought it was a training exercise for the little kids, and you had a, a yearling out there. Okay, we're going to teach the baby how we chase minky whales. Yeah. And then, and then eat them. Yeah. Well, and then, so for those listening, that's the aftermath was that those two families – were uh, to give you a, a sense of of time frame, we we left. It was the end of our trip, and I don't remember what what time it was. It was probably um, two o'clock mm-hmm. when yeah. we when we left. Um, they were they were done. The kill was done, and they were probably starting to eat, or at, at the very least. Tear in, tear in, and, right. and start, you know, taking Sharing. taking right. out what they're mm-hmm. not eating, and we had another trip, and so and and by the time we got back to the harbor, we had a break, loaded up the boat, got back down there at four thirty, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and I looked at the the tracks from our first trip, same and spot, same exact, yep. like exact, we were right on lap, top. right on top of where we were on the earlier tr- hours before. Right. And we spent about, what, an hour and a half there. Mm-hmm. And then when we left, there was still one other boat there, had not moved. Right. You were down there yeah, at that yeah. point uh, with Monica. Yep. And uh, and Orca Behavior Institute. Mm-hmm. And then at, we, we both left at the same time, and somebody else was still there for another hour or so, and he logged it in, in, in our... Our sighting. Oh, who was that? Oh, that was um, Tyler. Tyler. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And same exact spot. And they were probably down there in that same exact spot all night. 
eating. Yeah, and, and, no, for and sure. And when we saw them, all three of us, I mean, they were, they were in, in some different groups and pre, all prey sharing. Yeah. Hours and hours and hours later. Yep. Yeah. And it smelled. Oh, yeah. Oh, the entire time. Yeah. It yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I just I I was just thinking about the smell and yeah. Like, what what yeah. were your thoughts when you first got down there and saw like uh, you know these nine whales, uh, knowing what what they were doing and seeing them prey sharing? Well, I f- smelled it long before I saw it, um, even though there was no wind and all that. So we like could smell the oil before we mm-hmm. were even close enough to see whales, and um, I just remember. Um, forever wild calling when I got on the radio and was just asking like kind of where, where were things? Cause I didn't want to get right in the middle of it and they were doing some longer dives. Um, and he said, Oh yeah, there's a big gut pile like behind me. And I was like, oh. and I, you know, we don't think about that. We don't see, we don't see huge. I think he said a debris field of guts. I think that's what he said. That was, was it. Like, oh yeah. That will stick in my mind forever. Um, but it was really interesting. It was just interesting behaviorally. Like, obviously, I was kind of bummed that I'd missed the hunt. Um, but really cool to hear your guys' take of it. And then just to see the mixing of the groups as they yes. were prey sharing. Because originally, we got on scene, and it was T65A4 and 99B that were together. Yes, prey sharing. those two were. And pretty, they were together a lot. Yeah. And pretty quickly after we arrived... Um, T99B went back to the big group, like the big group kind of merged in with the two of them mm-hmm. and then split off again. And it was T65A4, T65A3 and T65A6. Right. Yeah, we, six, we had 99B and 65A4 there before the you got there, time. like almost the entire time until you got there. Yeah. And uh, the boys were together, 99C and 65A3. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we had Callisto with, who is she with? She hooked up with Was it Amir. Her older brother? Yeah. Yeah. 65A3. And then those two were traveling around. And then I think eventually A4 joined up with them. So 65A3 is a 15 year old male and he was with his four year old sister. And if you've been listening uh, for the last however many episodes, we did talk about 65A3 in one of the previous episodes. Um, he is one of the butcher boys. Well, he is an experienced he hunter. He yes, is, yeah, he yeah. is. And you know what? I think like we talk a lot about this, and there's been a, some sentiment, um, you know, from people that have heard about this that are like, "Oh, I really like don't like those whales because they kill um, this minky whale or or whatever." And um, I understand where that's coming from, and I also think like. They're doing what they're meant to do. This is nature. This like is nature's not some like eggs. flowing goddess with like, you know, whatever. Whatever that saying is, you know, she's kind of she's, she's cruel. A badass. Right? And and this was a really amazing reminder of just how wild um this is and how privileged right. we are to be of witness to this kind of thing. Right. Because um, it's okay in the Serengeti when a pride of lions takes down an old wildebeest. Right. So we have to start looking at things like, yes, they're beautiful and we assign them names and we get attached, but it's still nature. Right. And I think it's different too. Like when we lose a whale to a natural event like this, to something that's supposed to happen in the, in the food chain um, versus getting hit by a large vessel, likely a ferry um, with the minky whale that was found dead in, in, in the San Juan islands in the inner, inner, inner islands this week, just the day before actually. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's the heartbreaking thing to me is like when mankind has this effect on, on this, but seeing these animals do what they're meant to do, um, you know, who are we to assign? Right. And, and I the, think that, that my guess is it was probably a fairy. Oh, the other one. Yeah. 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 The ship and, which strike. would, which would, Make that the third whale in three years from a, from a Washington State ferry. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I know that there's been three. I just didn't remember timing wise, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But this this is like you said, this is a natural event. I mean, this is and it benefits so many different right, animals, right? Because not just the whales; like the whales will eat their share, and then the rest of it's going to sink down, and That's there's right. going to be sharks feeding on it, and crabs and all it's those other fertilize all the little things that you know come up and 
as um, yeah, yeah, as emotional as it can be, and as a, and like you you said, you know, it's difficult when you when these whales have names and and they're individuals and we know them. Isn't this a sign of a, of at least that part of the ecosystem being healthy? Right, right. And who are That's we a good point. as as humans? Like, who are we to assign the value of of a life? Right. Um, right. So, southern resident killer whales that eat salmon. You know, uh, salmon worth less than a seal. Is a seal worth less than a minke whale? Well, it's just something I think about. I, I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong answer, but it's just like who no, are we to assign the, the weight what about, of a life? And what about when the southern residents take a neonate harbor porpoise? Right. You know, so it's just all things to consider. Nature has its own way, and we are so far removed from that. Mm-hmm. We go to our our predation events are going to the grocery store. <laughs> right, we're right? very removed. We are, and I was actually just talking about this with someone. Is <laughs> like funny. how we kind of tangentially wander into this, but we are so removed from the process of well, of what know, we of are how ingesting, of, of how yeah. to survive. Yeah, yeah, so it's true. Like they're not, they're not like, oh yeah, you know, I'm bored, so let's go get something to eat, like like we do. Let's like kill we this are, sneaky whale, you right, know. We are so removed from from how to survive. For them, this was a huge meal that was going to feed the whole family, so they're not going to have to hunt multiple times throughout the day, right? Or even or for a couple days. of days, right? And it's a lot less risk for them, especially as two moms with younger mm-hmm. younger offspring that maybe don't know the the best ways to execute a hunt yet. Yeah. Um, a minke whale prob- probably offers a lot less risk than a full-grown stellar sea lion or even a juvenile stellar sea lion. Sure. Yeah. No teeth, no claws, and she wasn't doing any peduncle throws. So right. it was, again, very quick and maybe even merciful. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting things to think about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it doesn't make it necessarily any easier of, of no. n- seeing what happened. I keep coming back to, you know, just telling myself, like, my place here isn't to judge. Right. It's just to observe. Yeah. Yeah. And document as best mm-hmm. we can. Because that's important. It is. It is. Because I think we're going to see more events like this. And we've gotten a lot of questions on the boat just the last few days. And I've seen it on social media of people who are tying this into the altercation last week with between the mm-hmm. two adult humpbacks and a group of big killer whales. And they're saying, well, what's going on there? You know, like there's some... Like there's the this prelude to war between right, the right. baleens is, and the, and it's like a pretty. Well, no, I want to say normal, but for them it probably isn't an, an everyday right? or at least a normal occurrence for them. That's like that's what I I was thinking about today when I was thinking like how should we be answering that question? What does this mean? Because the events are have no correlation to each other, but what I realized was what it means is there are a lot of whales here, right. Because yeah, yeah. off the coast, this probably happens quite a bit where there's nobody seeing it. But right now, we, we have a lot of whales here, and we're out on the water w- with them. And so we're seeing we're seeing their world. We're seeing their their mm-hmm. society, their culture, and, yeah. and who does what, and who eats who, and who's aggressive with who. And, like, there's no, there's no like, oh, there's a fight for food. They're not eating the same things. And uh, yeah, it just it's like wow. There's there's a lot of nature here going on here. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. I even had a question. Uh, somebody asked if the pinniped population had been decreasing. I saw and, that that question and on your Facebook. It was. It's. I don't think the one has anything to do with the other. Oh. This is an event we've witnessed once in seven eight years, and we can now perhaps tie it to another event from five years ago, it's not like they're taking minke whales every other week. Right. Right. Or because, and because the pinnipeds, like if the pinniped population is either stable or going down, it's, it, there's still like plenty. Yeah. I mean, there's still, this is still the Las Vegas of pinniped tartar. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like I might have a prime rib dinner, but it doesn't gonna stop me from eating bonbons. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> like, that was a bad analogy, and I'm sorry to our listeners for that, but that's kind of what I was thinking. So, um, but no, it was, I mean, really incredible. And s- side note, the humpback whale that was one of the two that was like in the main altercation, quote unquote, with those killer whales we saw yesterday on our all day tour, Hydra, Hydra, yeah, looking good. That was a cool humpback interaction, it really was. Four humpbacks. And it just looked like they were super social. 
Yeah. That like roll, roll. lifting the head up and like right. kind of swimming through the water, but with yeah. the head like just lifted out was cool. Well, just, it was it was really cool because at one point my view from uh, from the helm was one humpback has its head out of the water. They're all traveling at like five knots, all smushed together. Mm-hmm. One has its head out of the water. One has its peck fin above the water, and the other has its like like fluke, fluke going like perpendicular to the other three yeah yeah but it yeah. wasn't on the end right <laughs> and it's like it's like what are they doing <laughs> i know it makes you whatever want, they want makes you wish you had an underwater camera to see like mm-hmm. below the surface totally yeah yes we need that so well uh thanks for recapping that hunt and we'll see if we see more of that in the future maybe in another five years We'll have the T sixty five A's and ninety nines back for that would be so interesting. Hunt. Yeah. I and I will will end that topic for me at least by saying that and this really April, this drove at home today when I saw one of your photos of uh T sixty five A Artemis, like right up in front, like not on top of but Oh, like, she was right it, next mm-hmm. to her. She was like in the minky's face. Yeah. And it's like, if if there's ever a photo that captures T65A and who she is, <laughs> it is that photo. Because she is, I mean, That's she's her the name. goddess of the hunt. She yeah. is. Yeah. That that Definitely photo name. is that and photo is Kalisto her. is yeah. going to carry on the tradition. Yeah. I yeah. can totally see that. But I think T sixty five A four too. But yeah, yeah. sixty five A six has some uh, spunk in her. Yeah, she does. Yeah. She's oh, totally. She's so cool. Yeah, she has a really cool whale. And I, I, I do also have to add for people who have been following along, um, T sixty five A five was not there with the family. Or sixty five A two. Or A two. Yeah. But A five, who's who we've talked about his saga of of just wandering. Around. He 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 skipped that day. And but he would have been there five years ago. He w- yeah, both of them would have. Yeah, yeah because yeah. they were not wandering as okay. much back then. But Kalisto would not have been. She was in the belly. She, she was the uh, the instigator for all the wandering. I think. So I all right. I have to. I, so I, and I have to ask this because this is kind of an interesting theory that April brought up. Um, so Kalisto was born after that, and we'll have to see if sixty five A comes back next spring with a new calf because maybe the like. The craving for minky is a pregnancy thing. Oh, maybe. Who knows? I mean, it would work timing wise, right? Yes, she, she's due. Know, right, she's as it were. Uh, but so is ninety nine B. Yeah, and sixty five A four is getting up there too. Yeah, yeah. So we got a lot of girls that hey, come on, make some babies. Yeah, and maybe oh, minky they, whales. They're working on it. I don't think <laughs> they need any encouragement. <laughs> All right. Well, um, that being said and going on from there, we've had a lot of listeners kind of reach out to us and we've actually had listeners on the boats. And um, I know it's kind of surprised me um, because we've had people come on that have been like, oh, I heard your podcast. So I came up for a tour and I expected the opposite. Like, oh, we joined a tour and now we're going to listen to your podcast. Um, But I, I wasn't expecting the opposite. Um, But people have been writing in with questions and Jeff, we got some nice emails from people with kind words from Wisconsin. Yeah, really, really appreciate. And and I, I remember what it's like to be in a landlocked state wanting to. to yeah, your alma mater. My alma mater. I, I spent four years at the University of Wisconsin and people tell me I had a great time, but I don't don't really remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that's true. And what were you studying that helped you get into whale watching? Oh, yes. Um Political science. Uh, you get a BA in political science at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and that will lead you to, <laughs> this, to whales in the Salish Sea, or a law degree, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. that's a uh, you got to stop there and and get a law degree, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio, on your way from Wisconsin to Friday. Sure, Harbor. sure. Sounds like a direct route to me. Well, we do say all roads lead to Cleveland here on the island, so <laughs> they do. But uh, April, thank you for continuing to stay on with us in this episode. Jeff and I love talking about whales. We're not always great about talking about ourselves, but we've had some questions 
about how we got into this. And so I thought you would might maybe help facilitate us yes. um, in talking about that. So, um, But now we know where Jeff is from and where he went to college and for what. And actually, Jeff, I was uh, in the legal field as well, legal Ooh. technology. That's right. Yeah. And, and after but law degree, I went into technology. I started with horses, horses to yeah. law to whales. Right. Why did you go through all of that when you grew up here? <laughs> You yeah, grew up in Washington I, State. I thought I loved horses enough to like make a life of it. And it turns out you don't really need a law degree or a law degree. Don't you really need a college degree um, to be a horse person? But That's true. 18 year old me didn't know that. I mean, and I loved my time at college. Don't get me wrong. But um, yeah, the equine program at Rocky Mountain College in Billings, Montana. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to sit in my dorm room and I had the live stream cam going on the west side and I would watch the whales go up and down the west side and wish I was home. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then you spent how many years after that doing horse shows? Um, well, gosh, just up until a few years ago, really. So like at least 11 years oh, I was wow. doing them. I would fly out on weekends and do them occasionally. I didn't know that. And yeah. then you had your other legal and then profession. I, <laughs> then I worked in that, yeah, for 11 years until 2019. So, it but, was but some of that I remember I remember road. you like like doing some of that while while on the boat. While on the boat. Right, you got to out ans- <laughs> You were answering the phones. Hey, you don't work for them anymore and they didn't even know how long you worked for them, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's true. I did get uh yeah, I got a, a letter thanking me for five years of hard service on my 11th anniversary. And I was like, yep, that's... and That's a that's, sign. That's a sign. Here's your sign. And how long did you work in tech before you finally made the move? 18 years. Oh, my um, God. I was in IT. And similar to Sarah, I would be in my office and I would have one of several possible hydrophones playing in, in real time, um, you know, waiting to hear whales go by and... Uh, either from Johnson Strait or Lime Kiln Lighthouse here off of San Juan Island. And uh, I, I think like looking back, it's like obvious what you're passionate about and what you should be doing, but what in the moment, and I think this is, this is like, I'm not good at, at talking about myself and I, I'm you know no different than anybody else on the, on their journey through whatever they're, they're doing. But if there's one one thing I, I will say, like in hindsight in, in my life, is that if it's obvious what you're really passionate about and it's not what you're doing for your career, find find a path to connect those things. Mm-hmm. Then what was the first year you came out to the Pacific Northwest? The first time I came out here was in, I believe it was, two, well, the first time I, I came to um San Juan Island was 2012. I came here for four hours. I was on a day trip. Um, and like, it's shocking to me to, to think that three years later, I would be living here uh, running a whale watching company. I have a question though. On that first ferry ride, did you ferry in or did you fly in? Ferry. Did you like pull into port and think, uh, oh, this I, is where I need to be? I, I, I turned to Joelle. I said, I said, we're home. And what about you, April? Did you like have that moment when you first came to the island? Oh, I love this place. Yeah. It I was visceral. It's a, it's like, it's a, yeah, it's a gut reaction for a lot of people that yeah. have found San Juan Island. I think, I think you had that reaction, April, because the whale watching trip you took was just incredible. <laughs> I'm guessing that it was with Captain Jeff here. <laughs> Uh, you would both be wrong. <laughs> My first trip was Deer Harbor. No, your first trip from this island. From this island was Jim. Oh, okay. Sorry, nice man. try, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, good try. Heather thought it was her too. So, it, well, it is. It is funny. The three, all three of us, met, um, as passengers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did. Sarah and I met in 2013 as a passenger on on uh, with uh-huh. Miles Legacy, and then. April was one of my first passengers when I started running trips. Yeah, and that was uh, 2016 when I moved out here and camped in my tent. And I'm sorry, I think I, <laughs> I may have moved us onto a tangent okay. away from, from something no, that we were, this, I guess that's what this is for. It is. Yeah, it's supposed to be organic. Yeah. So I think it was it was for all three of us. It was passion that led us here. Yeah. Which yeah. is what, what should be. 
should be, but it's not because of just the world we live in and, and the way we're, we're grown up, growing up under a lot of different pressures that, and I think for me, I didn't find what I really cared about, what I was really passionate about until I was late thirties, early forties. And it's, it's because I think, I think it, a lot of people will share this where there's just too much pressure to keep moving forward and find something and, and make more money, make more money and, Mm -hmm. and get, you know, get to somebody else's expectations. And we don't get a lot of time to really just breathe and find our, our passion and figure that out. Yeah. And And we're very lucky that we have, because there are a lot of people that never do. Most, do. Most people never do. And then we were lucky that when we did find it, we were able to follow a path and and, and we were very lucky to, that we were able to get here and, yeah. and to do what we do. And not everybody can. And, and Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I think that's right. kind of the tragic thing about life, maybe. Yeah. Because depending on what you want to do, sometimes it's, you have to be independently wealthy yeah. for some yeah. endeavors. Or willing to live in a shed. <laughs> there's that <laughs> no toilet and... i i had a camping toilet okay that's not a toilet though <laughs> it's like a bucket <laughs> okay but you're you're well, you, we'll you've move evolved on. i evolved. have evolved i actually have a house now and i you have do i have bathrooms and the whole nine yards <laughs> and heated floors heated they're lovely floors. <laughs> and i i just lucked out that i was in the right place at the right time wow these two are just I think we may have lost Sarah. No, I'm back. I'm back. <sighs> yep. Well, Sarah and I were always lucky because at least we were chasing horses and we had that animal passion and we we were on the right track. It mm-hmm. just took took me a long time to get out here. Yeah. Yeah, and I I was I was very lucky. I was in the right place at the right time with the right questions and ended up uh ended up buying into a whale watching company and not, and there was so much I didn't know. And I, there was so much I didn't know that I didn't know. Um, and it was the absolute perfect thing for me. It was the hardest change I've ever made, even though it was so right. Sure. And yeah. in hindsight, everything was telling me like, this is what you should be doing. And it's a no brainer. And I knew it was a no brainer at the time, but it was the scariest thing. And I, I don't think I have ever felt so much stress and anxiety. Yeah, because you left everything that you had mm-hmm. trained for. You went to school to do certain things, and there were expectations. And that's part of our cultural and societal problem is there are these expectations, and we carry that around, and we make it a weight, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, and when we don't meet them, you know, we're so hard on ourselves. And and to the point where it it suffocates out any space or ability to find what we really want to be doing. Right, right. And what, what makes us alive. I mean, I, I can tell every, for all three of us, when we're out on the water sharing whales with people and the wildlife, the three of us are totally just in the zone and alive. Yeah, it's the best part of the job. Yeah. It is. Except for when the whales get super curious and then I like shove passengers out of No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. I really don't do that. I think I've seen you do that. <laughs> one elbow. There was one. No. I'm just kidding. That was Jeff. Just elbow and there, to the eye. And there, there are. I mean, it's not. This is. I feel very lucky to do this and I would never want to do anything else. And I, I want to do this probably long past the the point where I'll physically be able to. Um, but it's not. Like nothing's perfect. Right. And was there a moment where you knew, like we talked about that with the minky whale, like there was a moment you knew it changed, but the hunt changed. But was there a moment that you knew you're, you had to do this? Like this was, this was the change. Was yeah. There, was there, there, was there, <laughs> the, like when you went in for the kill and this was it. Yeah. Like, I, I will. And I tell this story quite a bit and both of you have heard this story. Um, I had, uh, it was, I was still in Cleveland. Um, I just signed the purchase agreement for our condo in Friday Harbor. Uh, we still, we had not sold our condo in, in Cleveland. I don't even know if we had listed our condo yet. I had not signed a single thing 
for the, to buy into the to the business here. But as soon as I signed the contract for the condo, I was paralyzed the rest of the day in fear and was feeling like, what did you do? This is crazy. You have no idea what you're doing. And now you just locked yourself in financially to this huge obligation. When at the end of the day, um, Joel actually picked me up at work and said, how's your day? And I said, I can't do this. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I can't go through with this. I, I'm just, it's way too much. And she's like, no problem. She, like, what an awesome supportive wife. No problem. We can stay here. We'll stay in our condo in Cleveland. You can stay in your job here. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. I now own a condo in Friday Harbor, and you can come visit me anytime you want. <laughs> So that's when I knew like the train had left the station and we were moving and I had, there was no choice. I'm, I'm, I'm going and I'm going with this. That's when I knew it's like, there's no turning back at that point. Yeah. yeah. She was yeah. a truly supportive wife. Yeah. She, I mean, I, she pushed me when I needed the push, but yeah. then one, once, you know, I think once I got here and, and just I, more and more over, over the last, uh, over the, you know, the first couple seasons, um, and then learning the industry, learning how to find whales, how to curate trips. I realized now, like, this is what I should have been doing my whole life. Like, this is what I'm here to do. This is, this is, I can do this better than I can do anything else. And certainly better than anything I was doing, anything in it that I was doing for 18 years. Um, I can do this better. And I think that's, a a great service to my former business partners was me getting out of their way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you, you too. When did you know? Well, I have been coming out to the San Juan Islands since the early nineties, like pre free Willy. My parents were bringing me out here. So, um, I knew I loved whales from a very young age. And I remember, like going to the bookstore and running to the natural nature section and looking for books on orcas and buying um, the killer whale book by Ford Ellis and Balcom and flipping through it and tr teaching myself how to ID, like buying postcards and trying to ID the whales on the postcards um, as a very young kid. Um, so n knew that I loved whales from, yeah, from as long as I can remember. Um, but the tipping point, for like making the life change was actually one you curated Jeff and April, you were there too. It was the Dominican Republic trip, our conscious breath or breath adventures trip in 2019. Yeah. Cause I was right. still doing my other job full time. Um, I was doing this pretty much full time as well. Um, and that was an amazing trip and it just like was life changing. And I tell people that I think when I talk on the boat about it is, um, the only way to describe it was life changing. Like, there's nothing comparable to getting in the water yeah. with those whales. And, yeah. and, and you did. I remember we weren't back very long and the season was just starting to pick up and you told me that you had given your notice. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. within a month and a half. I gave my notice. I like, I got off, like I cried in the airport on the way home. Like I remember Spencer looking at me very like concerned and uncomfortable, <laughs> <laughs> but I just couldn't stop crying. And I was like, I have to go back to this other job. And my whole existence has changed, like where I fit in the universe and what, how I perceive and what I want to do with my life is completely changed from seven days ago. And I have to go back to this job that is draining me of every particle of joy. And no, I'm not going to yeah. do it anymore. So um, yeah. that was really the big catalyst for me. I think the, the Conscious Breath Adventures trips, and we talked about that in episode seven, I believe it was, the those trips are life changing, not just because of what you're seeing and experiencing, but I think they do cause evaluation in, in your mm -hmm. own life. Yeah. Yeah. And they kind of recharge you in some mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's very much like Gene talks about is now like, like now that you're, you're conscious, you're open. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. Yeah. And we're going back. And we're going back. Going back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> when did you know April? Oh, gosh. Um, 
I would have to say in 2014, that first trip out here, and the T-18s were my first family. Oh, that's cool. Right? Wow. They were so, a good first family. Right? Over by Turn Island, believe it or not. They were in San Juan Channel. And there were boats everywhere. And those guys didn't care. They didn't care a bit. And I went home and I started, I was on Zillow like every day. <laughs> How do I do this? <laughs> and the next year I brought my husband out and he's like, if I'm going to live on an island, I want to be able to see the ocean. And it was a great time to buy, and we got a piece of land. And yeah, and then and, and built the shed. Built, put up a tent first. <laughs> 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 then got a contractor. Then got the shed. And uh, eventually, I went out with you a couple of times, and and that was it. You guys were crazy. <laughs> 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 you called me into the office, and you and Spencer were like should be working for us yeah. and I was like okay yeah yeah awesome and now you have an amazing house that we go and eat crab at we gotta go crabbing <laughs> no. yeah. yeah it's time for us to do that yeah we haven't we have not gone crabbing yet this but year but it's been a, a wild ride I mean I can't believe it's been seven seasons for me now with Maya's and yeah. I think you too me as too. well and yeah. eight for me yeah so Keeps getting better every year. It so, does. So, what if if there's somebody out there who's interested in doing and in getting into this, whether it's for, uh, naturalist, captain, uh, intern, whatever they're looking, or they're looking to get more training. How do you get into this from a an education and training standpoint? What would you recommend to people? I would recommend what I recommend to anybody looking to get into a new area of interests is networking. It's a small community mm -hmm. and there are so many people with so much to offer. Um, whether it's personally from them, if they have the time or if they have, you know, contacts or, or links or whatever. Um, man, just getting in touch with people is a good way to start. And, you know, coming out to the islands, if you can afford that, um, there's some good naturalist training courses on Vancouver Island with MERS Society that have kind of give you like this broad general overview of topics and then really finding what speaks to you. Maybe it's, maybe it is the whales. And I know a lot of us, all of us, three of us came out because of the whales, but there's a ton of amazing stuff out here and it's going to speak to everybody differently. Maybe it's the minky whales, maybe it's harbor porpoise or seals or what have you, but um, could finding be the foxes could be the foxes, Island marble butterflies. Oh, Who knows? Yeah. You know, um, but really like finding what sparks your joy and then networking with people because they're, they're going to help you find a way. Yeah. They'll help you with the job, where to live. Yeah. And, and if you can't make it out here like directly, then you can always have an, on there's online communities, right? Yeah. Plenty of that. Great well, access. And I think when you're networking, um, out of your passion and something you're interested in, it's far more authentic mm -hmm. than when you're at a networking event trying to find clients. Like mm -hmm. if it's, if it's a topic that you're, you're authentically passionate about it. Networking is, it's just natural. It's, it's easy. easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you end up getting connected very, very quickly. Sure. What would you say aside from that? Is there something you would recommend? Spending, spending time out on the water, mm -hmm. spending time in the field. I think, you can go get formal education in different marine sciences mm -hmm. um, and then that never hurts, but that's certainly no, it, there's no match for time in the field to do something like this. Right. Uh, the naturalist courses are really good. They give a really good, that you'll learn a little bit about it's like a, a great lot introduction. of things. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But then you fill everything in and get really deep into it by spending time out on the water, learning from other naturalists and reading. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not, this is not something that requires a, a formal education. I think the number one requirement is uh, you have to be passionate yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 I think definitely like you, there are a lot of people in the industry that do have like a marine biology degree, but definitely not required. It's not something that I look for when, I'm looking to bring someone onto the team. Um, it, it really is about passion because, you know, we can teach the skills, 
Right. But mm-hmm. you can't teach about the passion. You no. can't you can't instill that in someone that is not. There are so many books it. that you can read that will fill in mm-hmm. these little spaces. But yeah, you're right. You have to have that passion. You're going to learn more um and it's going to be like foundational like second second nature information to you learning from passion as opposed to like learning from textbook. Yeah, and that's nothing against like a college education or going right. for a marine biology degree because definitely that's an important path and we need science as Absol- well. Absolutely. No, there's um, no yeah, that was not meant as one or the other. Right. But it doesn't have to be your only option. I know I was never good at the math. I was never good at like the science. Like it just did not compute with me. But I put me in front of a a stack of photos and I could ID whales for you all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's that was kind of where I fit in. And everybody has their own place that they fit in in this and 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 being out and being um, exposed to it and exposed to other people that are involved in it. You'll find where your niche is. Yeah, and and both of you are are incredible at at IDs. It keeps me up at night. I'm not gonna lie. How? If how? people send me a photo, I can't ID. I it does. It keeps me up at night. And how often does that happen? I mean, not very often. But <laughs> yeah, there you go. But often so enough. You, so you miss like two nights <laughs> of sleep a year. It's more than that. <laughs> okay, so do you do you fact check people on their IDs? Oh like, yeah, I ask for a lot of information if I like if it's not immediately recognizable or if like the photo is kind of low quality. Like, definitely, I'm asking like when was the photo taken, where was it okay. taken? Because you know sometimes it's like a postcard and you never know. Mm-hmm. Like I had someone actually send me a photo of a postcard today, and they were like, "Can you ID this whale?" Because I'm not good with residents. And luckily, I had my book that i bought back in the early 90s ford graham and ella or uh ford ellis and balcom killer whales book because i could look through that and say oh this is uh h4 of the northern residents and this photo was probably taken between 1986 and 1993 because he got the new notch sometime before 1993 but after 1986 oh my gosh i felt proud of myself for that one but yeah uh, you know there are ones that are like a tiny blob and I can say it's a killer whale, but I can't give you anything more than that. You wouldn't just make something up. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> what did I say on the boat yesterday? Which wasn't true. I lie about a lot of things, but not about whale IDs. You've I don't lie, lie about a lot of things, but definitely don't lie about <laughs> whale IDs. So what, what else would you, would you tell people to do? Well, um, or we can just edit that out. No, no, I think it's a good question. And I, you know, I'm famous for awkward pauses on this podcast. So, um, I really do think like creepy, awkward pauses. I think it was, was it originally? Okay. Well, I'm going for less creepy this time. Um, I, I think putting yourself out there and that's something that we've talked about too, is like making that leap, even if it's scary, even if you don't know where the path is ahead lies um is like putting yourself out there and that is the hardest thing to do Mm -hmm. take it from me like i do not like putting myself out there um but it's really important and that's how you're gonna get these opportunities and maybe you're just writing an email to ask if you can join for a month you know somewhere um riding along because you want to get introduced to something or, or are you looking for an internship you know intern you know what have you whatever it is Mm -hmm. you have to put yourself out there I think all three of us had to take a, a leap of, of faith, a big one, yeah. to do this. Yeah. And I, th- I think everybody who is changing careers or changing, uh, making any kind of major life change, um, w- no matter what it is, it, it, ha- it requires a, a leap of faith. For sure, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I... I had a great paying job and not that I don't make money with this. I make enough to, to survive and, and I'm comfortable, but um, you know, we're not in this for the money. We're in this for the passion of what we do. And, and um, it's just, yeah, it, it was a big leap of faith. Would I be able to make ends meet? Would I be able to pay all mm-hmm. my bills? If this is, if I'm working seasonally, basically like right. I'm going from a full-time job year round to um, potentially seasonal work, am I going to be able to make this work? But I just, 
did it anyway. Oh, you yeah. know, with the faith that something would work out. I don't yeah. know what you're talking about, about not enough money. I, I, this has allowed me to buy my dream, <laughs> Your dream car, my all time dream car, a 2010 Volkswagen Jetta. I heard you listed that for sale. <laughs> that was not me. It, it got listed, but not by me. But you had so many potential buyers in about five minutes. Yeah. Oh, less than that. So for those who are curious, somebody listed my car on Craigslist for, uh, $2,000. And within the first 10 minutes, I think I had about 15 calls. And this was while you were out on the water. <laughs> this was while I was out on the water a running a trip. <laughs> and I just, w- w- my voicemails were piling up and oh, I could see them tra- transcribed on my iPhone. I'm like, who's, <laughs> why is my car for sale? That was a good prank. It was very good. To be clear, I did not do that. I know. I know it wasn't either of you two or you wouldn't be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is there anything else we should cover about? I mean, there's tons of questions and I, I feel like we could spend a lot more time answering them, but we've kind of used up our allotment for this this one. But and we w- keep sending us in yeah. questions. We, we appreciate we're, uh, we appreciate all the feedback we're getting. Um, I appreciate, we appreciate people are leaving some reviews and ratings on iTunes and and other places and emailing in questions and comments. We really love that. Or letting us know on the boat, uh, if you listen to this podcast and you're coming out on a trip with us, definitely let us know, let us know. You can get all our contact information at after the breach podcast.com. Uh, we will post photos and some video uh, of all the things we mentioned in the latest sightings and the minky hunt. Uh, those will be on our, our website, afterthebreachpodcast.com. We're also on Instagram, at After the Breach, and on Facebook. Yeah. Well, definitely reach out, guys. If any of this has like, sparked more questions, feel free to, to let us know. Um, we'll try to get back to us. And April, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Of course, really of course. Yeah, thank you, April. And we'll have to get you back on for some future episodes and uh, hopefully some more great encounters on the water. Yeah. And we'll grill Sarah about history on killer whales. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, yes. That's my dream. All right. Well, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah. And have a great night. (laughs) 